Hello, and welcome to another edition of the Your Therapist Needs Therapy podcast. I'm your host, Jeremy Schumacher, licensed marriage and family therapist. To support the show, head over to patreon.com slash wellnesswithjer, or share and like and subscribe to the podcast wherever it is that you're listening. We very much appreciate your support. Today, uh, we have a professional who is not a mental health professional, but a professional in many different realms, musician, author, uh, stand-up comedian, uh, just one of these ultra-talented human beings who is doing awesome work, who is late diagnosed with neurodivergence and in the process became this jack of all trades. I'm joined by Lane Moore. Lane has written multiple best-selling books. Uh, her first book, How to Be Alone, If You Want to and Even If You Don't, is uh, an introspective view of her experiences in kind of getting used to being alone, not growing up with a great family situation introducing some concepts around healthy boundaries and chosen family, which then Lane fleshes out in her second book, You Will Find Your People, How to Make Meaningful Relationships as an Adult, which is a fantastic book. I highly recommend it. I'm adding it to my bookshelf in my therapy office so people can see it and we can talk about it because making friends as an adult is really hard. And it's one of those things that I talk about regularly with people. And her most recent book is You're Not the Only One Fucking Up, which is full of useful practical tips on how to improve your online dating scene, how to present yourself more accurately, and how to hopefully find some better matches out there. Lane is also a host of her own podcast, I Thought It Was Just Me, which you can find on patreon.com slash Lane Moore. She is the creator of Tinder Live, a stand-up comedy show where she scrolls through Tinder and goes over, uh, interacts with the audience and swiping left or right on people. Uh, it's a lovely show. It's very well reviewed and not at all about roasting people or making fun of people, but kind of providing catharsis for people who are dealing with the nonsense that can be online dating. So yes, super stoked to connect with Lane. Um, very much talking to people who are late stage uh, diagnosed with neurodivergence is very much my jam and a lot of intergenerational trauma, family trauma, chosen family, like all these things that I'm, I'm so thrilled to talk about because I see it regularly in my office and I think it's wonderful to get voices from people who are professionals in other fields, uh, not just mental health, also talking about it. So super grateful to Lane for taking the time out of her very busy schedule. Um, Lane has written for The Onion, she's written for The New Yorker, she won a GLAAD award while she's the editor at Cosmo for her work in making uh, Cosmo's work more inclusive and um, more diverse, including LGBTQ plus writers and topics and like winning the GLAAD award's a really big deal. So without further ado and preamble today, I am joined by the ultra talented Lane Moore. Lane, thanks so much for joining me. I'm so excited to talk to you. Yeah, thanks for having me. I love having non-therapists on the podcast because I think <laughs> therapists can be really dry and <laughs> clinical. Or like, oh, this is the diagnosis. This makes so much sense. Totally. And uh, the way you talk about mental health and your own journey with it and the way you wrote your books, like I think is just so much more relatable to folks than saying, here's a clinical diagnosis. Hope this helps. Totally. And, you know, I think it's, it's one of those things for me, I've been in therapy for most of my life. Some, a lot of therapists were not super helpful, uh, weren't super accessible um, to me. And so I think for a long time, I really had to kind of, and I think this is true for a lot of people, kind of had to be my own therapist and navigate it myself if you can't find really good care. And I think the great, you know, and I've also had good therapy experiences, but I think that based on all of that history for me i really had wished that so many of my therapists had been able to explain it in a more human way in a more nuanced way that i could internalize as opposed to you know something on a page that seemed really distant and didn't really encompass everything i was going through and then also you know there's just things that i learned on my own that when i found the words for it it really clicked in a different way and I also know how helpful it can be. Like therapy can be so, so helpful if you find a great therapist, but also there's something really to be said for hearing from somebody who's lived it. Because if mm -hmm. you're talking to your therapist and they're reading about it, that's very different than hearing from somebody who's survived these things, lived these things, knows what you're talking about and can and actively relate to it. And I think that was 
you know, that's so much of what I want to do in, in my work where it's like, I, I think both have a really important part. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the lived experience helps give people language to experiences that are hard. Like you're a writer, you're good with words, putting it into language that someone's like, Oh, Holy shit. That's me helps so much to be like, read this paragraph. That's, that's me versus having to come up with the words on your own. Totally. Because I think that can be such a challenging thing when you're struggling with mental health stuff. If you feel like, you know, you don't have the words to express what's going on with you. That was true for me for so much of my life where, you know, I honestly, a lot of the diagnosis that I, uh, realized that I had, I had to come up with on my own. I hate that for me. I hate that. I, I hate that that's true for anybody where, you know, you have to get real lucky with that. So it's like, for me, I think a lot of what I do is if I can help people get there faster <laughs> than I was able to get there where I really had to fumble around and there was so much pain and not understanding why you are the way you are, why you feel the way you feel, why you have such a hard time interacting with the world. And look, in a perfect, perfect world, we all meet the perfect therapist who unlocks that door for us. But hey, I want that door to be unlocked anywhere. So if somebody, you know, even if they love their therapist, but there's doors their therapist hasn't been able to unlock, if I can help them unlock it. I'm so happy for that. That's what I want. Yeah. 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 And I mean, in, in your life history and your story, like there, are, I'm assuming there were times where therapy was also inaccessible. You talk about living out of your car and not having a ton yeah. of support. Like, that's hard to be like, all right, I'm in the Walmart parking lot. Got to wake up and go to therapy tomorrow. Like, that's just not always accessible to everyone. No, yeah, exactly. And it's like, uh, you know, a lot of times people love to just be like, oh, my God, seek help. And it's like, first of all, do you know how hard it is, especially in this country, to find a really good therapist, to have one that takes your insurance, you know, all these things that we make it seem like uh you know this personal responsibility that if you have mental health struggles you uh better figure out you better fix it and it's like well that'd be great but also i think that it needs to be a community thing we need to stop individualizing this like oh you're traumatized take care of it get rid of it you mm -hmm. like it's some horrible thing and that it's easy to get rid of i think most people with mental health struggles they want to that no one's loving this. No one's loving a mental health struggle. No one loves feeling like they're completely alone. No one loves feeling like they're trying to tell their loved ones, how do I explain to you how this feels? And you don't see it. You don't understand it. It's such a horrible feeling. So, you know, so much of what I want to do is make it so that it is this community thing. It's not this isolating thing that, that seems like this, this, horrible burden you're choosing to carry we're we're not actually <laughs> yeah yeah and writing your your books you talk about like attachment style and family history and some of these things like that might be what you're going to therapy for without being aware of it without knowing this is what i'm carrying with me into the office totally and i wish i had known about that before you know i remember having a therapist years and years ago and i was in this relationship and i didn't uh understand my attachment style yet i didn't know what was going on i remember telling her like mm, i really want to break up with him but i also really don't and sh i'm not i'm not sure and she was like well then break up with him life is short and i talk about this relationship in my first book how to be alone because there was so much more going on um <laughs> there was so much more going on in that relationship and with my own mental health and what i didn't realize i had i didn't fully understand how my trauma was manifesting all this stuff and sometimes you know if you have somebody who's not super trauma informed yeah and you tell them like i kind of want to break up but i don't know of course they're going to say just break up just move on but sometimes we want to cut and run because we're scared. We don't know how to accept a healthy relationship. We don't know how to accept someone who's loving us. So the answer was not to break up with that person. I, I would never have given that advice. You know, I, I would have asked more questions, but mm -hmm. yeah, if you're not trauma informed, you're just like, oh, this person seems unhappy. Let's free her from this. No, because I went back and forth with him so many times. We were breaking up all the time, you know, because I just didn't know how to figure out my own nervous system and what was coming up for me. And, you know, so when I learned about attachment styles and same thing, you know, started during the pandemic, started um, 
you know, was was kind of figuring that out in, in how to be alone. And I talk about it some in that. And then um, really during the pandemic started kind of translating them in TikToks in a really funny way, because a lot of what I had read about attachment styles, again, similarly, was this really clinical thing that was hard for me to absorb. Mm -hmm. um, just the way, you know, ADHD brain, and you're just like, what are you, I'm, I'm, I've lost the train here. I don't understand this. And it was such a fun thing to do because I figured that out just from kind of taking the information and looking at my own relationships and being like, oh, I get it. I know how to kind of translate this for people whose brains are maybe wired like mine. And a book of clinical text is not going to be absorbed by my brain. Yeah. Yeah. And and I like the difference between even the books you write and showing up on TikTok or Instagram in a different way, like a therapist who's trauma informed, a therapist who knows what neurodivergence actually looks like out of a, like this kid can't sit still in school. Like there's so much beyond that. Yep. And a lot of therapists either don't catch it or aren't asking questions about it. And so like simple advice or empty platitudes that don't make sense to your brain. Literally that. And it's like, you know, I'm always, I'm always careful when I talk about it because I don't want to make it sound like all therapists are bad. Therapy isn't useful. I've had such great therapists, but they've been few and far between. And even sometimes the best of your therapists don't understand neurodivergence, aren't taking that into account. Um, you know, don't have you know, there's things that they really are good at and then there's just blind spots or things they haven't studied or things they're not informed on and that's okay. And, you know, you're still grateful for the help that you can get, but, you know, at the same time, how great would it be if everybody had access to a therapist that fully understood a neurodivergent brain and fully in was trauma informed and all these things. And I don't think I've ever found that in one therapist, you know, it doesn't mean that those therapists can't be helpful, but, you know, again, there's this missing link uh, that we want to talk about, you know, just go see a therapist, any therapist. Oh, honey, I, the number of times that I have had to explain trauma, have had to explain uh, neurodivergence, all these things to my own therapist. And then you just leave and you just cry. Like, did I just educate my own therapist? And, and then I paid them. This sucks. This isn't what I want, but you know, the, the good thing that I was able to have come out of that is, was able to learn a lot on my own that I could, you know, put into my books, put into my podcast, put into social media and say, look, not every therapist you meet, even in the best of situations is going to fully understand this. Fortunately or unfortunately, I've had to figure this out. Let me help where I can. <laughs> Yeah, and I think I think people who can translate that, I think also just normalizing you might need to see more than one therapist over the course of your lifetime. Like oh, I've you seen don't have so to... many, so many. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, I think it's the medical model where like you grow up with your primary care physician and then you're like, Oh, I need to get a physical. I'm 30. I guess do I see my like child doctor or who do I go <laughs> see? Like therapy's yeah. not like that. Find someone who fits where you're at and can help you with what you want help with, not like you're in my insurance and you're close. So I guess you're my person forever. Right. And feeling like you just have to. And that's the thing too. It's like, it's, I, I always want to, um, you know, validate how exhausting it is to do that. And if you find one and they're not a good one and you kind of maybe thought they weren't, but you wanted them to be, and then they say some I'm just say some stupid shit and you're just like, Ugh, that's like really harmful. And those empty platitudes. And you're like, are you sleeping through this? Have you met me? How are you just giving me this? Like, let it go. And you're like, nothing about a neurodivergent brain can simply, and also like, can simply let trauma go. Also, that's not how trauma works. If we could, we would, it's just so, you know, those experiences are so, challenging so um and, and exhausting and you really you know you go to therapy because you want to feel seen and heard in a way that you might not feel from anybody else and then when you have a therapist who doesn't make you feel that way you're it's it's so horrible you just feel like okay well what place is safe and so you know yeah so uh, hopefully you know through kind of translating these things that you you can find solace from people who understand why you're pissed that your therapist said that, who understand why that was a really careless, not great thing to say. And I think one of the things I love about the work that I do is that not everybody 
has access to other people in their life who understand these things. For most of my life, I absolutely did not. I was around a lot of people, you know, I talk about this a lot in You Will Find Your People of reaching out in moments of like real serious mental health challenges. I guess I talk about it in How to Be Alone too, but, um, you know, but in How to Be Alone, I was more just like, oh yeah, everybody sucks when it comes to talking about mental health. And then, you know, and, and You Will Find Your People talking about it you know, I wanted to write a whole chapter about how to help a friend who's struggling with mental illness because I still, even now, will will run into people who, you know, you're in a low moment, you don't know who to reach out to, you reach out to someone who says they want to help, and then they say some stuff like, well, do you have a therapist? Like, to try to kind of pawn you off on them. And it's just a knife to the heart for me. Like, just that sort of like, ew. And even if this isn't what they mean, it just reads as like, this is icky. You're not fun right now. Can you like go talk to a pro? And you're just like, I just want a friend. Why can't friendship encompass compassion? You don't have to be my therapist. You don't have to do it perfect. But I want people to treat their friends with mental health struggles as not this like diseased strange creature who needs to be pushed off to somebody else. There's, that's not how our world should function. It's really not there. You should be able, even if it's something as simple as like, you know, I'm so sorry you're feeling that way. God, that must feel so lonely. That feels so heavy. Why can't friendship encompass that? I truly believe that it should. Yeah. And, and you talk about that in, in how to find your people, like this idea that friendships can tolerate discomfort. And that was like this eureka moment. You talk about it in the book, like this eureka moment for you, like, oh, holy shit. Like, it's okay for a friend and I to work through a thing instead of it just needs to be like nice and pleasant all the time. And I never wanted that friendship. And I always felt so weird for not being okay with just like locking up all my feelings and struggles, you know, that were outside of the, the pleasantries of like, an Instagram post where you're just like, these are my besties. They always got my back when I talk about really simple problems. Like, you know, like I don't, I didn't want a friendship like that. I, I wanted to be able to, even at a very young age, I always wanted to, you know, I, I was brought up in a world and an environment and a culture that really hasn't changed. It's changed a, a little bit. Um, but really didn't want to talk about feelings, really didn't want to talk about struggles that were outside of, you know, oh, I'm trying, I'm studying for a big test this week. Like all these sitcom problems that are what we're told are appropriate to talk about within a friend group. But if you're going through anything more than that, that's weird. That's dark. That's disgusting. Come back to us when you're, you have jokes for us mm -hmm. has been so, has been like, a through line in my life. And, you know, I, I wanted to be free of that. I wanted more than that. And, you know, the way my brain works, it's like, I want it for me and I want it for everybody because I know I'm not the only person out there, like having this exact conversation. And I'm grateful for whatever voice is in my head or my heart that knows and knew as a little kid, oh, if I'm going through this and this is hell, someone else is somewhere. Even if I don't know them, even if they don't tell me, and I wish I could free us both from this. I wish I could do that. So, you know, it's so remarkable and kind of mind blowing when I get these DMs and stuff from people who are like, oh, you absolutely did that for me. My brain is like, <laughs> you know, like able to process it and also unable to process it because that, was such a such a dream of mine such a like deep want of mine since i was a kid yeah 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 and i think the online community you you are you're interesting you occupy this weird space where the online community around mental health neurodivergence um lgbtq plus issues like bi erasure all the stuff that like i think the online community can be super helpful for yeah and then you also also do Tinder Live, which is like the worst part of the internet. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, Tinder Live isn't, but yeah, dating apps. Yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> right, yeah, so that's what I yeah. meant. That, that yeah, the yeah, dating community <laughs> is like, oh, 
I can find these people who I would never connect with in, in the rest of the, the, my life. And like, here's my community of neurodivergent folks online. And here's my, my people who are like, yeah, global warming's a problem. We should do something about it. <laughs> but then in like totally. dating and these dating apps, it's like the worst of the internet distilled through an algorithm into yeah. being frustrating and crazy making. Totally. Well, and you know, it's so funny because with Tinder Live, like for people who don't know, I guess I'll tell them a little bit about what Tinder Live is. I go on um, my dating app on a big projector screen and we swipe through in real time. The audience chooses who we swipe right or left on and then we message the most chaotic profiles uh, possible, which if you've ever swiped through particularly men's profiles, you know is most of them. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, because there's some people who haven't done it and they're like, oh, these must be just wonderful men that you're roasting. Like, first of all, that's the opposite of what I do and what I think is funny. Um, but no, it, it's really it's calling out these profiles that'll just be like, oh, women are crazy. No fatties, no single moms. I, oh, you seem ugly. Like, you better shave every day. All these toxic men's profiles. Um that are really, uh, you know, can be really harmful and exhausting. And the reason that I started Tinder Live was to explore this thing that can be really isolating and exhausting and alienating. And you feel like, oh my gosh, is anyone good here? And even if, you know, there are good profiles on there, but the process, and this is true really for all genders, but of swiping through all these things and seeing somebody say something really hurtful it's like a drive-by like even if you swipe left you still had to read that you still had to see it you know you still had to see some weird transphobic joke you still had to see some racist thing like you still had to wade through it and it's hard not to to let that kind of ruin your day so what i really wanted to do with tinder live was to let people know well first of all make it a communal experience and make it something that was cathartic because the character I play on Tinder Live is really taking aim at who a lot of those toxic guys want, which is someone who's like really young, has one brain cell, you know, no, like, no, no needs, no needs at all, uh, super drunk, super horny, and kind of plays with that and in a way really takes the power back and creates this thing that's like, I know is so cathartic and funny for people because I hear from so many women who are like, I thought I was the only one seeing profiles like that, getting messages like that. And you think it's because you deserve it. You mm -hmm. think because something is wrong with you, some other woman who's prettier, smarter, better, or whatever, she doesn't get that. You get it because you deserve it. And that's not true. We're all seeing the same crap. We're all, you know, navigating this. And so... And then, you know, I hear from men who are like, I didn't know it was this bad on dating apps. And I'm like, yeah, you're welcome. Now, you know <laughs> that it's yeah. like, it's, this is, it's a, it can be rough. Yeah. Yeah. It's, and I come from it from a different perspective, obviously, uh, like I'm a marriage therapist by training. And so I see all these, these couples who maybe don't stay together and that's the best outcome. And then yeah. they've not dated for a decade or whatever. And they yes. go on Tinder and they're like, what the fuck is this? What am I supposed to do? I always, I always love that. I, I get a lot of people in the audience, exactly, who are just like, I've been married for 20 plus years and now I have to do this. And what even is this? And I'm like, I know, I know. And so it's like providing that catharsis, but also providing, you know, I will call stuff out on stage and be like, hey, here's why everyone in the audience groaned when I read this guy's profile, because there might be someone in the audience who has that in their profile and doesn't know why it's bad. So I, I genuinely want to make it better for people. So it has all these threads. It's not just like, look at this moron. Like some of those people aren't morons. They just don't know how to communicate what they're actually trying to say. I learned this where I, I started um, during the pandemic and I still, I still do it. I started redoing people's dating app profiles for them to make them less toxic and to communicate their emotions in a way that was less alienating because that's really what it is, right? Like there are people who are just crappy on dating apps, but some people don't know how to communicate what they want in a relationship without being like, I don't want you to be like this and don't waste my time. And it's like, oh, that's not how to say that. And some of these people are good people who just don't have the words, don't have the tools, which I'm sure you see all the time too. 
Yeah, and if they're spending time online, they're getting Andrew Tate recommended to them yes. or, you know, Jordan Peterson or whatever. And, like, that's yeah. making their words worse. Like, right. they're getting bad He's information. Like, yeah, and then, you know, and I got to say, those toxic profiles, I always look at them and I'm like, you're still on the app because this is it doesn't work whoever whoever you know whatever andrew tate article or like video you watched that told you this was the way to get women you're still single bro this isn't this isn't the way you know it's just like somebody who got bad information or had some toxic douche friend tell them like tell the women that they all look ugly they'll clamor for you and it's like please how, how can i undo that for you i would love to <laughs> yeah yeah and for all women i would love to undo that for them Oh. Yes. Um, I love in your, your first book, your opening, uh, who you're writing the book to is this laundry list of shows and songs and artists. Um, and I want to touch on that because because yeah. your books cover these concepts of chosen family and social support and like normalized. It's hard to have a friend as an adult. Yeah. Um, but I love that kind of unspoken message that like, hey, sometimes when you're growing up and your family's not great, you this is your family. These are the people you learn from. These are the the things you connect. Here's your role models. It might be a sitcom character or a superhero. And like, that's okay if that's what you have available to you. Yeah, thank you. I was really proud of that book dedication because, you know, it was my first book and all the book dedications that I would read for other people were like, thanks to my mom and dad for being so loving every day of my whole life. And thanks to my perfect husband who brought me, you know, gold wrapped candies every single day. And I'm like, I didn't relate to any. I was like, does every author on earth just have the best family, the best partners? I, that's not my experience. And so I wanted my book dedication for How to Be Alone to be a dedication to all the the TV characters that felt like friends to me, the the authors who felt so kindred, the musicians I would listen to and be like, oh, you get me. Like that was my friends and family. Those were the people who had always been there for me. Um, so I always love when people appreciate that because it was kind of like, you know, a gentle finger to all the book dedications. They're just like, I've always been so loved. Now I'm gonna talk about how life was hard for two seconds. Like. I didn't like those books. <laughs> they made yeah. me feel so much more alone. You're just like, how how can you write this? And then you're just like, but everyone's, I've never had a bad day ever. And I, I'm sure that's not what it means, but that's what it read like to me. Yeah. Um, I do want to highlight one of the shows you you talk about in there that I never see talked about. And my yeah. ADHD brain was like, Lane and I are best friends already and we've never met. Uh, <laughs> you, you mentioned Strangers with Candy and... The biggest Strangers of Candy fan, biggest Strangers of Candy. Um, I I loved that show so much. Terry Blank is so incredible. I just everyone on that show is just so unbelievably perfect. Um, yeah, there's some there's some deep cuts in that dedication that I always love hearing from people. The one that they're like, oh my god, you mentioned this, and I'm like, yeah, I was obsessed with that. I don't think I mentioned anything in that list that I wasn't obsessed with. There was there's I'm not really passive about anything, especially with you know, neurodivergence and ADHD stuff. Like if I mentioned it, I've seen it 4,000 times and I know everything yeah. about it. Yeah. <laughs> the the dedication is also very coded ADHD as I was reading it. I was like, I don't know if Lane's neurodivergent. I don't want to diagnose a, uh, someone on my podcast, but like, this is pretty ADHD. I, I extremely, extremely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. I always love when people read that and they're just like, I know you've since talked about it, but I knew before. And I'm like, great. Great. I wish you had told me sooner. It would have been nice. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if you've experienced this, but I say this to my clients a lot because I diagnose a lot of adult ADHD that was missed oh, wow. earlier. Like neurodivergent yeah. brains find each other. It's so weird, but like uh, there's a communal aspect. It's like, oh, your brain doesn't work the way society says it does, should. Mine either. Cool. Let's be friends. I think there was a lot of that too in like my younger years where I was around only neurotypical people or only straight people or whatever it is. Oh, sorry. Um, and you don't realize that's part of it. And it's not that that person's bad, but like you realize like, oh, you don't really get me and I don't really feel seen by you and I don't know why. And it's not that, you know, you can't be friends with neurotypical people, but I will say increasingly I've been like, I don't know if, if I really can. I don't know if I can have as deep of a friendship uh, with somebody who's neurotypical because it's just, you know, you have those little moments where it infuriates you that they're just like, I'm going to go 
run my 30 errands today and come back home and do this. And I got everything done and life is just easy for me. And you're like, this is making me sad. <laughs> I just, this is awful. This is like a, you know, girl boss Instagram post that I just can't, I can't be around, you know, hashtag not all neurotypical people or whatever, but you know, yeah, you just kind of are like, I want to be friends with other, other weirdos who get why something is affecting me so deeply that like, quote unquote, doesn't matter. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, awesome. Lane, this has been a lovely chat. If people want to learn more about your work, um, follow you on socials, where do they go? Where do they find your stuff? Yeah. So um, I'm at hello Lane Moore on Instagram and Twitter and TikTok and everything. Um, if you want to find out about tour dates, I have some really cool uh Merch also that like I hand draw and is very mental health focused. Um, all, all that stuff is lanemore.org. Um, and you can find, yeah, tour dates. I think I said that already. ADHD brand is coming hard. Um, I also have a mental health and relationships podcast called I Thought It Was Just Me that touches on all this stuff too. And that is on Patreon, uh, patreon.com slash lanemore. Yeah. And we'll have all those links in the show notes so people can find them. Lane, yeah. thanks so much for A, all the work you do, and for B, coming on and chatting today. Yeah, thank you so much. It's, it was wonderful. And to all our wonderful listeners out there, thanks again for tuning in this week. We'll be back next week with another new episode. Take care, everyone. <laughs>